All right, folks. So I wanted to take just a couple of minutes to share with you uh, some things that had been both on my heart and on my mind lately. Uh, just some interesting things that, I, that had come across my path. And then I want to get to some of your questions that you brought up uh, this week. And I thank you very much for sending those in. We had some good, thought-provoking questions. Angela? Might want to explain that this week's going to be different from normal. Yes, this week is different from normal. Normally, we're just going verse by verse through the Bible. But this week, we have a little, we're taking a little break. We've been in the book of Exodus, no, Genesis now for 28 weeks. It's a long time. But we're on chapter... 28. So we're halfway through. <laughs> That's a long time. Uh, but it's been, has it been rewarding? Yes. It has. Oh, I, we yeah. have learned so awesome. much. We have learned so much going through it. But tonight I want to start with a couple of things. First, Passover next week. I hope you're, you're all ready to go. I mean, if you're not, you're in trouble. Um, 7 o'clock. Please arrive early because we'll be starting the Seder and eating. Yom HaBikarim, Resurrection Sunday, if you want to call it that, also known as Easter. They're in certain parts of the world. Right there on the Sunday. And then the next week is the last day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Mm -hmm. And we'll be meeting on that day to pick up again where we left off in Genesis. Okay? Yeah. Awesome. Now that we've got our house cleaning out of the way, a note regarding spiritual Mitzrayim. What is Mitzrayim? Egypt. Egypt. What does it mean in Hebrew? Constriction. Like a python squeezing the life out of you. Have any of you been in spiritual Mitzrayim for the last couple of weeks? I will tell you for a fact that I have. It has been a time of constriction, and I want to note to you that I've, sp I've spoken with several of you over the years about this same concept, that frankly, when I began this journey through the Hebrew roots of the faith, it was probably coming up close to 10 years, and it didn't happen for a number of years, but after a little while, I don't know what changed. But I do know that the time leading up to Passover, for me and for a lot of you, has just become a period of constriction, spiritual constriction. There are tensions and anxieties. It often flares up as um, dissension in the ranks and outside the ranks. You know, just people getting on each other's nerves, dealing with family and friends that are irritating you and just sometimes just experiencing some depression, maybe some anxiety. I think that this is a spiritual malady. I don't think it's spring fever because we don't get that here in this, in this state. <laughs> right? right. We're, not, we're not cooped up in the winter. We get beautiful weather. We get to go outside and play all winter long so we don't have cabin fever. I mean, yeah, you hear about spring fever happening with places that have been socked in for the winter, and I understand that, but around here we don't really deal with that. But I know that people get a little stir-crazy, and things just kind of get out of, out of hand all over the place this time of year. And I personally think, and many of you have agreed, I mean, I welcome your opinions, that it feels almost to me like God is really wanting us to experience the, re the birth of freedom when we get to the Passover. Because I can tell you this, that once we have our Passover Seder and Passover has passed, it somehow gets a lot smoother. It's like you really experience this. Angela? Having had two children, <laughs> I know that there is no birth without that constriction. That's how it happens. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So let me ask you this. Has, have any of you this season prior to Passover been experiencing some of this stuff that I'm talking about? Oh, yeah. I, I see a lot of hands. So I'm, I, everybody waving their hands. Yes. <laughs> yeah, two hands. I'm feeling you, man. So what I want to do is I want to tell you, what can I tell you aside from be encouraged? This is for our spiritual edification. 
That, you know, why are we tested? It's not so that we can fail. Who's wanting to trip us up? Our adversary mm -hmm. is definitely wanting to trip us up. But why would, would our Father in heaven do that? To see if we'll follow in the way. That's true, absolutely. He gives us tests in order for us to pass, not fail. He wants us to graduate to the next level. You don't give your kids tasks that to perform anticipating that they'll fail. You don't want to crush their spirits. You know, Our adversary definitely yeah. does. He's going to put those tests in front of us. And just like Job, you know, Satan has asked permission from, from God uh, about Peter. He's asked permission to sift you, Peter. He's asked permission to sift you, Job. And, you know, the Father in his gracious wisdom, knowing that all things work together for the good, for those who love him and are called according to his purpose, says, you know what, go ahead. I'll let you mess with my servant. Watch and see what he does. Mm -hmm. Did they pass those tests? Job did a pretty darn good job. Yep. He did get a little bit of a rebuke. Maybe he, had a poor, he got a little bit of a spanking. Mm -hmm. Did Peter pass that test? Yeah, not, not quite as well. He denied Yeshua three times. But, and then he went fishing. But he got back in the boat. That's right. He got back in the boat. Yeah, he didn't leave. Tracy? An example of how Yahweh works is he gave him the chance to redeem himself by asking him if he loved him three times. Right, right. the opposite of denial. Absolutely, absolutely. Sorry, Jerry? It's like uh, Yeshua went into the wilderness for 40 days. Yeah. And that time he was, had three tests. Right. And that was leading up to the Passover. Yes, absolutely. So he kind of went through Absolutely, it. Yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Angela? Um, when I give my kids a test, it's not necessarily with the, the goal of the pass or fail, but so that me and they can figure out what do you still need to know. Yeah. Sure. And maybe yeah. that's what our tests are about. That's a great point. Out. Great That's point. Good. That is a really good insight, Angela. I appreciate that very much. And her and I, you know, when we were in education, we call that pretesting. So you give a quiz to your class on something that most of them probably will have no idea about. But you might find a few kids in there that are overachievers who are like, oh, I know this. Which is great. But now I know, before I even teach you anything, what do they know? And I can compare those tests before and after and see what have you actually learned. So I would just want to encourage you to be in the Word, especially the Psalms. I've got a list, if anyone wants it, of my favorite Psalms that are super, super encouraging. 23, 27, 34, 91. There's a whole list of Psalms that are just so spectacular that I'll send to anybody who wants it. Tracy. <laughs> and then after this, I just plan on going straight into the next book, which is Psalms. Yeah. So I think that's just so amazing because it's going to yeah. take you out of this period and into this, yeah. you know, all these uplifting. Yeah, and yeah. That's amazing what our kids teach us, isn't it? In <laughs> fact, I was with the children this week studying the end of the book of Genesis with Joseph. And we talked about that. The kids were and I were talking about how Joseph, um, you know, he's doing one or the wrong mind in his business having dreams and his brothers throw him into a pit and try and kill him. This is bad, but it turned out for good. He's running along minding his business, getting in charge of Potiphar's household, and then gets thrown into prison. Running along minding his business, bam. But we talked about this fact that things are building up. He's being relocated to where he needs to be at the proper time. And now he's whining, I'm in prison. I have got stolen from the land of the Hebrews, and here I am in prison. I haven't done anything wrong. Remember me to the Pharaoh. But that turned, do we know that that turned out for the best? He needed him to be in charge of all of Egypt so he could not only save the whole world, but save his family in the land of Canaan who needed to get some food as well. So everything that was going wrong in Joseph's life was building up to what was right. And if he just... We need to remember to have our faith. 
But faith is remember, it's a challenging thing to remember all the time when you're in the midst of it. But you've got to remind yourself. I have been in the habit for a long time of just writing out things for myself that I need to read to myself to remind myself, you are blessed, things are going well for you, I anticipate having a good day in spite of the fact that I feel like crap and I'm experiencing some panic, maybe a little depression, I'm a little overwhelmed with work, whatever it is, I got to constantly remind myself, that's a spiritual battle. And the Word is the most powerful spiritual weapon. That's what Yeshua was dealing with Satan in the desert, you know, quoting the book of uh, Leviticus and Deuteronomy, just, you know, spitting it out to fight, that, to fight the enemy. So I would encourage you, I want to encourage you, Get in the Word, listen to sermons, do whatever you have to do. People talking about good, uplifting things. Remember the book of, of, uh, of Philippians where, where P, uh, Paul says, you know, those things that you saw and heard in me, practice these things and the God of peace will be with you. And if there's anything that's good and righteous and holy and uplifting, think about these things. Uh, and, and don't be anxious for anything, but with prayer and supplication and thanksgiving, give, you know, make your requests made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and your minds through the Messiah Yeshua. Yes, powerful words. Amen. Powerful words. So those Psalms and those few quotes from, from Philippians, they're amazing to me. So powerful. And I just want to encourage you, because Passover's coming up next week. I hope... And I pray for all of you that this week will be a little bit smoother. <laughs> that this week will be a little bit smoother. I know it's been challenging, but I know it will. And now, do you have any questions, comments, or concerns regarding that? I'm going to do a brief historical survey about a subject that I was kind of reintroduced to this week, and this is about the Enlightenment and systematic theology. A fascinating, fascinating thing, and I hope that you'll enjoy it. I, back in like 1992, I became fascinated with systematic theology. Let me ask you a question. Do you know what systematic theology is? No idea. Okay, I'm glad to hear you say that. So, you know who John Calvin is? Yes. The guy who was like the founder of Calvinism? There are different brands, if you will, just like there are different brands of Christianity, like Baptists and you know, Lutherans and Calvinists and stuff like that. There are different brands of systematic theology, and John Calvin was one of the first in the 1500s to write a complete and a, and a very good commentary on the Bible in the 1500s. The entire Bible commented on the whole thing, and he did a great job. But he also began, and, and this goes back even just a uh, uh, it kind of started with him about him kind of organizing his ideas and kind of working things out but systematic theology is a is a way of trying to understand faith and the Bible and who God is and how he works and how he works in your life and how he works in the church and uh, what it does is it seeks to place everything into a system an organizational structure so that you can look at anywhere in your Bible regarding this faith and this God and this Jesus and everything and just make it fit. Now, in, at the time I thought this was fascinating because I wanted to see, I had so many questions about the Bible and I was like, well where does everything fit together? And that's what systematic theology tries to do is make everything fit. Now, there's some great things about that. But there's also some challenges about that, because you can imagine if you're trying to have a holistic, systematic approach to understanding God and the Bible and such, you just know you're going to run into some issues, right? Yeah. Because there are things which are hard to describe, hard to define, which you're going to have to shoehorn a little bit. And that's, that's a common thing. But Systematic theology really didn't come around and come into its own until about the 1700s. And the reason for this is because of the Enlightenment and the age of reason and the sciences coming into play. Now, you guys probably remember this from your history classes, that the, the you know, reason and logic and the scientific method, the Renaissance, okay, explodes into Europe in the 1700s and everything becomes very different. There's a huge clash between religion and science. People of faith and people of secularism, secular humanism 
rises in the world at this time. Prior to this time, you're not going to express these kind of ideas out there in the world because you'll die. You'll get killed, right? I mean, we had to have a reformation so that people could have the right to dissent with Martin Luther. Prior to that, you, didn't, you just kept your head down and your mouth shut. You'll die. But when some of these, you know, some of the, the, uh, the reformers began to speak out, they gained the right to, to challenge the established doctrines of the Catholic Church, right? Mm -hmm. But what does that open the door to? Challenging the doctrines of everything. Okay, so it's great to have an open mind, but if your mind is open too much, people will throw garbage in it, right? But here's the thing. Once you open that door, then it became a flood, and you began to question everything. And the scientific community comes along, and Darwin comes along, and everybody comes along claiming that things are totally different, and why do you believe what you believe? And it was a real challenge to Christian faith, right? You guys know I'm not telling you anything you don't know, right? Okay? Now, how did the church respond to all of this criticism and uh, questioning of faith? They responded with systematic theology, trying to science if, if I could coin a term, religion. Trying to categorize it, classify it, and apply the scientific method to religion. Now, I just want to ask you with a show of hands, how many of you think that's going to turn out to be a great idea? We've got hindsight. Well, We've got hindsight. I think that science doesn't necessarily disprove anything. No, it doesn't. I think if anything, it proves a lot. I agree. I agree 100%. And you can see that as scientists continue to get better in understanding the world and everything. I think it proves God. There's no question about that to me. And I know there's probably not any question about it to you. Angela? I don't think the issue, though, is the, the facts that science discovers. I think it's Yeah, and I'm getting, I'm, I'm getting there. Hold on to that thought, Angela. Who was going there? Nathan. I think that uh, people try to put uh, Yahweh into a box and try to make everything fit. And they, yes. They, they never find a box big enough, so right. it really just becomes a way of responding, uh, ignoring parts of the Bible. You know, sure. It's kind of like a philosophical framework to place over the Bible that you read. Very true. Very true. And then, um, also, take, take into the account, the scripture says that there are people who are dull of hearing and can't see, and there mm -hmm. are parts of Daniel that are sealed, who is worthy to break the seal. Sure. So the Bible is not something to easily systematize. No, and it's when, not. And when there is a, a sort of divine censorship going on, it's a fool's errand anyway. Sure. Okay. That's a great, great insight. Mike? I think too, you, it, when you develop something like this, it would be just as easy for the church to push this kind of Theory out because there are not Bibles in everyone's home during this time. Sure, that's true too. Good that's point. Had access to sure, yeah, that's very true. Although the printing press had been developed, we're still working on getting the Bible into everybody's hands. It's not the best selling book like it is today. So, you all have made some excellent points, and I think that Angela mentioned um, that what, and, you, you, and Nathan did as well is that the response of the church to the pressures of the Enlightenment and in trying to develop a systematic theology to try and answer all of the critics' questions, we kind of stepped in it. We fell into their trap by agreeing to talk about our faith in their terms, which I think is a huge mistake for a couple of reasons. Number one, as Nathan said, you can't put God in a box. You're not going to systematize everything that God has said. There are things in the Hebrew, and you guys have heard many times, thinking in a Greek way or thinking in a Hebrew way, where the, you have to, especially Greek is a very linear and logical type of language, which is very good for argument and rhetoric and, and the scientific method. That's a great language for that. But the thoughts and the, this, the, the description of things in the Bible does not easily lend itself to being categorized like that. I mean, you've got several concepts like free will versus predestination. How are you going to rationalize those things? How are you going to systematize that? You're not. You can't. And that's why you have a systematic theology of the Calvinist variety that will try to take everything and shoehorn it in to make it fit. And what they'll inevitably do is take those passages which kind of speak against 
predestination and express human free will and just kind of push them aside because they don't fit the paradigm. And those on the other side of the argument will do the exact same thing. We just take the scriptures and we shoehorn them into our ideas. But really what the, one of the biggest problems is is that we kind of give over explaining our faith and the tensions that it often holds for us into some way being systematized and rational and logical. And you know, ration, rationalism and logic and, and, and being able to explain things in a scientific method, it's great if you can do it. But remember that we're dealing with things of faith. And those things are not often categorized very well. They just defy human reason and logic, right? Yeah. Can remember, you your own image? no, you can't. And you can also remember the scripture in Romans that Paul tells us that the things of God are foolishness to a natural man because the things are perceived spiritually, they're not perceived with a rational mind. And that's why it says that he has made foolish the wisdom of the wise. And there's so many scriptures about that that says, you know, he, he's just chosen to save us through the foolishness of this gospel that is preached. The gospel is foolishness to those in the world. It makes no sense to them. Now, why do I want to bring this to your attention? What in the heck does this have to do with anything? Allow me to tell you. I'm so glad you asked. <laughs> many of us... Whether we are evangelizing, trying to tell people about God, the reason I want to tell you this is to take the pressure off of you. That's basically what it comes down to. Because the things of God are foolishness to a natural man. The reason I want to tell you this is because when you heard the gospel for the first time, for some of you it may have been so long ago you don't remember, but some of you maybe it wasn't. Someone told you this foolishness and your heart leapt you're, you skipped a beat and you realize there's something here, okay? The, when somebody first mentioned the gospel to you, or maybe you were born and raised in the church, but you didn't really ever take it seriously until you were such and such an age, and then it all became real. It all started to click. It all started to make some sense or something like that. You know what I'm saying? That's the spirit of God yeah. inside of you, which is quickening your spirit to accept the things of God because formerly they were foolishness, mm -hmm. okay? That's the sense in which it becomes valuable to you as an evangelistic tool when you, need to sh when you want to share with friends and family the gospel message of the Messiah, coming to save them. My purpose in this is to take the onus off of you. You don't need to be clever. You don't need to be wise. You don't need to try. It's not, the weight is not on you to share. It's on God. He is saying, I will do this. You just tell them the truth. I will quicken their hearts. I will do the work. So that you don't need to get into arguments with people. You don't need to beat somebody over the head with anything. You don't need to, t t to harass them or talk to them about it every time you see them or something. You know, a family member who's unsaved or a friend that you want to, uh, you know, get them involved in church or something. It's not up to you. Do I think you should be prepared to give an answer to anyone who asks for the hope that is in you? Absolutely. Yeah. You need to be prepared. You need to know your own faith and be able to describe it and explain it and why you believe what you believe. But yes, you should definitely be able to do that. But there's a slight crossover point where it's like you can, and I know I have, and I know probably many of you have too, you kind of begin to take this weight upon yourself. And if somebody rejects the message, you can become down or you can think I didn't explain it well enough or blah, blah, blah. It doesn't matter. It's not on you. It's on God. That's his job, to save souls, not yours. You just tell people the foolishness of this message and he will quicken their hearts. That also applies to people that you want to talk to about the Hebrew roots or why they, you should think they should not eat pork or that you think that they should uh, worship on Shabbat or, or do, the, do the feast days. You don't need to convince people of that stuff. I know every one of you... If you're into the Shabbat and you know, keeping the feast and eating you know, clean foods and such, did, that, did somebody sit you down and, and talk to you about this stuff and convince you that it was true and there were, took several sessions and you really had to be convinced? No. No. It didn't happen for any one of you. Not a single one of you. I have spoken to all of you and I know that you heard it somewhere probably on the internet. Probably by some dude with a long beard and flowing robes. It was just <laughs> bloviating and just going nuts on this stuff and you're like, who is this madman? 
But you know what? This madman, also known as Michael Rood, boy, my spirit just came alive. And I first, the first thing I did was I said, I don't think so. I know you probably did too. You were like, this totally does not jive with what I have been taught my whole life. But you would it would immediately you knew something was up because it drove you where? To your Bible. And you had to look up and see, is this dude speaking the truth or not? And you know what you found? He was. And your your heart and your mind was changed pretty much instantly. You didn't nobody argued with you about it. And I just want to encourage you, you don't need to argue. You don't need to get bent out of shape. You don't need to take that weight upon yourself, whether you're proselytizing in any sense. Let it go. Let God do what He's going to do. You do your part and let God do His part. Don't take His part on your shoulders or you're going to get real frustrated real fast. Yeah. Speaking to the choir. <laughs> Say amen if you are the choir. Amen. Thank you. Nathan. What if, uh, what if I like That is a whole different story, Nathan. <laughs> You know what? There's a, there's a place for you too, Nathan. And I like to argue as well. I'm happy to argue. I really am. I love, no, I don't like to argue. I love having discussions. I love having discussions. And I, you know what? I, I think it's great fun to talk about it. But you mid you know, whatever you want to call it, I'll call it arguing. That's fine with me. I'm okay with that. But some of you may not be and it can be it can be discouraging even though I do like to argue about it it can be frustrating and discouraging at the same time so sometimes I do want to stay away from it <laughs> Angela because you might develop expectations there would be a result from your arguing and you need to not have any expectations yeah I think that would be the best attitude to have is uh, I'm willing to talk with anybody but don't put any stock in the outcome let leave that with God and you just do your part and don't take on his part. Yes, ma'am. Do you think it's silly to say to somebody, if you really want to talk about this, we will, but you, you need to agree with me to begin with that after we're done talking about it, we still love each other? I think that's a great way to start. Absolutely. Absolutely, I do. It makes me feel better. Sure, absolutely. Because then I know that I'm not. It's like politics. I can disagree forever, and so long as you keep your mouth shut, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Darren, did you want to say something? Oh, okay. No, politics is something that I, I used to talk about politics all the time. Not anymore. That has become incredibly frustrating to me. <laughs> Damn it. I just think it's really not about arguing. It's about asking the right questions. Sure, and sure. when you ask the right questions and you build a relationship with somebody, it's about yeah. relationship and answering someone's questions. Sure. And that is really where yeah. it's at. It's not... You said something really key right there. You said something really key right there that I want to point out. You said it's about answering somebody's questions. Yeah. It's not about your questions for them because those are challenging questions. Mm -hmm. It's about their questions for you. Yeah, absolutely. That is, you know, when you really study apologetics, I think that that's what you learn. Is, sure. You know, asking the right questions to get someone to open up in what they look at. Because this world, if we don't, we are lights. And yeah. we are supposed to share the word of God. Mm -hmm. And how do you get someone who, um, I have neighbors that don't believe. Sure. And I spend time with them yeah. to, you know, I take them over something to eat. I go to their house sometimes because they invite us to eat. Yeah. How do I get them to open up about what they believe? Sure. And it's by asking questions. Yeah. Sure. What do yeah. you believe? Because this, really, the, the world that we live in today, either people are so busy they don't think about mm -hmm. where mm -hmm. they are going yeah. and how they're getting there. They yeah. have no, they just don't think that way. And yeah. I mean, I'm dealing with somebody who is in their late 70s, sure. and they're not thinking about where they're going. Yeah. That's a little unusual. Yeah. Yes. And so it is up to me at this point, you know, if I feel led by, by yeah. the Holy Spirit no, to witness to them absolutely. and ask them questions. But sure. First, it is about building a relationship. But I can't go in and just... Sure. They don't care what you know until they know what you care, right? Okay. No, I totally feel you. But that is what it is about. It's about just making sure, you know, do they have questions that they, that they yeah. have? And, you know, a lot of people 
my mind have been hurt mm -hmm. in a church sure. or a particular group. Yep. And so that is generally why they've left yeah. whatever it is they believe, whether they're Catholic, it doesn't matter. I don't sure. know what their faith is. Yeah. But usually it's because there's some kind of hurt that, <coughs> that yeah. somebody went through. And I think it's really yeah. important also to get to the bottom of that hurt. Sure. Okay? But not every church is that yeah. way. Not every group is that way. Yeah. Well, I think you're talking too about of, of ministering, you know, and really getting into people's lives, and I think that's a that's a great thing. That is a great thing, and that's that's kind of what an evangelist does. And I think, frankly, we need to recognize that an evangelist evangelism is a gift of the Spirit that God gives to certain people. Not everyone, you know. You might. I think I know you well enough to know that you have more of an evangelistic spirit, and you love reaching out to people and talking to people. And I think you need to recognize that about yourself. It's like that's kind of my calling is to talk to people about God. That's a different thing. No, no, and that's. Not, I don't think that's a great idea. But I, and you know, I think and I hope that my words also apply to you. That if you don't put too much weight on yourself, you know, yes, you know, you have a task to perform. But don't take it personally if somebody says, you know what, I'm totally rejecting what you say. And don't put a lot of weight on yourself. You share and you do what you got to do, but recognize God's part. That would be all that I would say about that. Yeah. Absolutely. How are they going to know if there's not a preacher? Absolutely. Not to watch about Jesus, they're not. TBN went out a long time ago, as far as I know. Thank you. Um, I think one of the most profound ways to speak without speaking, if you will, is our walk. Sure. Because the Lord says about us being the salt sure. and the light. Yeah. And people will see by what we do that there's something different. And that optimally that, that would be the way to go is for people to recognize the light that's in you. And Yeshua talked about the same thing in the Gospel of John. He's like they come to the light because the Spirit reveals yeah. that they have been wrought in the light. But they who don't have, they're not being drawn, they run like cockroaches from the light mm -hmm. because they don't want anything to do with the light. And if you talk about works and deeds in both of those places, let them see your light so they can see your good works and yeah. glorify your Father. I well, think that's, your words definitely speak louder than your words. I know that. You know, if they can see your life and that there's a certain amount of peace about you and you're honest and diligent and hardworking, friendly, loving, kind, gentle, those things speak a lot more volume than talking to them about something. Your words are not nearly as powerful as your life. There's no question about that. Well, just to take on that, Daryl has been an example of that at, since we've been married. And, and people will come up to him going, what is it about you? You have something. Talk to me. I mean, seriously, that's how. It doesn't it is. get any better than that. If. The aftershave. Oh, yeah. <laughs> You're going old school with the old spice. I like it. It doesn't work. I think that's precisely what it's talking about when it says be ready to give a reason for the hope that's in you. Right. That, that is that hope that's in you shining out, creating that light. Yeah. Absolutely. And that opens the door that oh, yeah. is amazing. Absolutely. I totally agree. And in a way, Alan, it takes the pressure off of you having to evangelize. And they come to you and ask you. Well, you know, it's like being in business, you know. Would you like to go knock on people's doors or would you like to have them call you? Pick up the phone and call you. That's always better, isn't it? <laughs> That's your objective. He's learning. Yes, he is. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. The, the example of fishing, you know, it's like fishing for men. If you want to do it, the evangelism is fishing for men, you know, think about it. If you throw your, your line out in the water and your hook is in the water, is it attractive? 
Mushroom. You don't even know. It's under the water. You have no idea what's going on under there. Uh, that's a, you know, and you know what? I, I take Tammy's point, though, and I think we need to kind of balance this by saying, yes, for most of us who are not involved in evangelism, and that's not that we shouldn't be, you know, talking to people about our faith, but that we need to be attractive bait. I think that's a good that's a good point. But if our job in the spirit is to evangelize people, and that's what the spirit has called us to do, by golly, you should definitely not be stinky bait. You should look, you know, be attractive, not, not be a false representative of what you're doing. But if you're out there banging on doors, then that's the way you're doing it. God will bless that, you know, if that's what you're doing. That's your calling. Yes, that's some people do have that gift, and they can pull that off. Yes. This lady here at the grocery store. Yes, Aunt June at the grocery store. I would <laughs> no, and you know what? I mean, you can talk to Gracie or Jan June, you know, or Tammy, just talking to people at random about stuff. That's a different thing. I can hardly talk to people I know. <laughs> she can hardly talk to people she knows. Believe me, that is true. Very true. Who's which? You guys want to fight it out? Good. Good answer. Good answer. Tracy will find it for us. I am where the Lord wants me to be. I'm in His way, and He and that lets Him lead me. And that has an awful lot to do with it. Getting up in the morning and starting with God. Yeah, and yeah, absolutely. Where He wants you to be. The right shoe on first. Where's that from, Tracy? Seeing if this is just like a paraphrasing of something that we have. It's, I know that phrase, but I don't know that it's from the Bible. It sounds like it might be from Poor Richard's Almanac no, or something. Genesis 24, 27. He said, Bless be Yahweh my God of my master Abraham. It was not left destitute. My master, it was Eliezer. mercy and his truth. I am the way Yahweh led me to the house of my master. Okay. Yes. When we talked about that, when we talked about Eliezer, that he put himself in the way of what was going on. Yeah, absolutely. Did it. That's right. Absolutely. Tracy, sorry. Mm. <laughs> you lost it? I'm sorry. Okay. I'm so sorry. <laughs> It'll come back to you in just a second. Fishers? Evangelism? Being a light? Okay. Good point. Somebody has to be Martha. We're going to get all 40 people fed now. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Martha. <laughs> that is true. That is true, Angela. Um, so I hope that that brief thing about systematic theology and, and kind of helping us to explain to ourselves, you know, what is our explanation for some of this stuff? It doesn't always work out, you know? You can't always put God in a box Take some of the pressure off of yourself. You don't have to explain everything in the, in the perfect way. God will work those things out for you, and it'll work. And you have evidence that it does, yeah. and you know that. You look back on it, you say, God was using me. Just remember that, and try not to get you know, bent out of shape if you're dealing with people you know, who don't want to believe you and you don't want to follow the gospel. You know? That's, it is what it is. Um, I want to bring up one thing here, which I had a, a, an interesting discussion this week with somebody, and it was regarding um, understanding the difficult words of Paul. And this is just something that I want to throw out to you. You know, <clears throat> somebody was, was, was talking to me about um, understanding Paul, and I said, you know, they were like, well, you, you kind of need to, oh, you've done it now, Chris. <laughs> 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 you 
Here's something that we really need to come to grips with. And I haven't come to grips with this still. It's a challenging subject. But I want to say this. If you read the Torah through to the end of the Bible, some people have the idea that if you're well-founded in the Torah and you understand the, what the Torah is talking about and the prophets and the writings, and you move into the Gospels and it just starts to flow and you start making sense of things and it's like, okay, I can see how this is going, this is working out. And then you get to Paul and you fall on your face and you're like, I wasn't prepared for this. Then you get past Paul and you go to Peter and James and John in the book of the Revelation you're like, okay, things have started to get back into shape, you know, this is starting to work out like it should. Paul is this huge stumbling block. Now some people have gone with a really large, weird misconception of Paul. Others have thrown, decided that they'd like to throw Paul out of the Bible. Nobody would do that, Nobody would do that Nathan. <laughs> Here's what I, what I want to propose to you that you might consider. There's a missing piece of your Bible that you simply will not and cannot understand Paul unless you have this missing piece. It is not in the Torah. It is not in the prophets, it is not in the writings, and it is not in the New Testament at all. It is first century Judaism. If you don't understand, and this, and this will make perfect sense to you when I give you this example. You ever heard of historical criticism? If I read a book that was written 50 years ago, you realize how much this world in America has changed in the last 50 years? We're talking Andy of Mayberry here, okay? Some of you people may not even know who Andy of Mayberry is. You know, the little kid fishing, whistling, uh, Ron Howard as a little kid going fishing. You want to, there you go. You heard that whistling tune before? Things were very different then. If you read a book, like it's in the tune of Ari, ha, Ozzie and Harriet and Andy of Mayberry, today you're going to think, I have no idea what is going on in this culture. Things are, I don't, I can't relate to this at all. It's very different. And it was, it was very different. But now I want you to consider that you're reading a first century rabbi who was steeped 100% in first century Judaism. Judaism, I want to remind you, is not in the Bible, it's not in the Old Testament, right? Judea Where did Judaism come from? Do you have any idea what, the, what is the difference between Judaism and the Torah of Moses or you know something like that, Nathan? The doctrines of God and the commandments of men. Judaism? Well, that's what, how Jesus differentiated it. You teach okay. the doctrines of God and the commandments of men. Okay, excellent. Jerry? It basically came, I believe, from the Pharisees. It did. Where did the Pharisees come from? Where, are the Pharisees described... Is there some some group of people that go to synagogues and roam around the countryside teaching people is that a description of anybody in the torah of moses no well i know well did they have a disagreement with the sadducees and yeah sadducees the sadducees are what they call now the sadducees that's right okay so the sadducees are the priesthood right and the scribes and the elders those guys those guys are described in the torah of moses these pharisees are not found in the torah of moses where in the heck did they come from they created themselves they came out of the religion of Yehovah in the old testament when they went into babylonian exile they didn't have their temple they needed a way to kind of keep the people unified and keep them on cultural track, so to speak. And so they set up synagogues. And they had teachers who were not authorized necessarily as Levites or priests to teach the people. These were just men who had what we've talked about before, the Hebrew word shmika, authority. Recognized as gifted teachers. This had been happening. You remember that the last book of the Bible, Malachi, right? That's the last book of our Bible, of course, but that's not the last book of the Hebrew Bible. The last book of the Hebrew Bible is uh, Second Chronicles. But in our book, how much time period had passed between the last time that an inspired author wrote in the Old Testament and James or John or somebody wrote the first words of the New Testament? How much time had passed? 
over 400 years, okay? Since that time, the last of the prophets wrote before the Babylonian exile. Ezra and Nehemiah are writing after the Babylonian exile. Those are some of the last authors of the Old Testament. Judaism had already begun and been established. You can see the very first hints of Judaism in the book of Nehemiah and Ezra. How, do you re how would you recognize that? Do you remember the story well enough to know that a commandment was made, a fence was built around the Torah? Do you remember that? What was it, Mike? To make sure they weren't buying and selling on the Sabbath day. Right. They said, we're closing the city gates and you outside, stay outside. If you beat on this door to try and come in and sell stuff to us, we're going to beat you. That's what literally what he said. I will pull out your beard. That's what Nehemiah, Nehemiah and Ezra said to these guys, these Gentiles who were knocking on the gate wanting to make sales on the Shabbat. He says, if you keep doing that, I will open this gate and thrash you and pull out your beard. They built a fence around the commandment of you shall not work on the Shabbat. They interpreted that to being buying and selling, stuff like that, and they had some perfectly good reasons for doing so. Those are your first hints of rabbinic Judaism. Since that time, 400 years went by, and by the time Yeshua shows up on the scene, we have Pharisees, which are the... the rabbinic Judaism was well on its way. Now, if you don't understand what these people taught and what the, the culture was of first century Judaism at the time of Yeshua, we can kind of get a little hint of that because Yeshua keeps batting heads with these people saying, why do you keep inventing these things, these commandments? That's the only thing we really know about the Pharisees. They seem to be building extra laws. But Paul was a first century Pharisee. Are any of the other people in the Bible, in the New Testament, any of the other disciples Pharisees? Not a single one of them. Paul is the only author in the New Testament that was a first century Pharisee. And he says of himself, I am a Pharisee of Pharisees. As far as all of my brothers who were Pharisees, I was ten times more hardcore. Zealous for the Torah of my ancestors. So when he talks about what he talks about, he's coming from a whole different place than your other writers. That's why you notice so much difference between him and the other apostles who are writing. He's a very different fella. And I'm here to tell you, I'm here to purport to you, and I encourage you, don't believe what I say, look it up. When you have a better and more clear understanding of Judaism in general, and first century Judaism in particular, what Paul says will become so much more clear to you. You can see that the, the Essenes, in the Dead Sea Scrolls, use a lot of the same language that Paul does. Under the law? That is a phrase that was well known in his day. The Essenes use that same phrase, under the law, when talking trash about the Pharisees. Those, those the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the Essenes were arguing with each other all the time. That was one of the most common things leveled against the Pharisees, is the under the law. So if you want to understand Paul, and you want to put him in his proper context, and you want to get rid of a lot of this confusion in your mind, I would highly encourage you to take a look at the historical context in which Paul wrote. You'll get a lot of more mileage out of that, because that's the missing puzzle piece in regard to understanding Paul. Rabbinic Judaism is not in your Bible. There's nothing in there. The only way you're going to learn it is through either researching it or reading some history books or something. I would highly encourage you, in your electronic Bible, you have a couple of free books that can be downloaded for free. The Right Manners, Customs, and Bible Lands in First Century Judaism, Alfred Edersheim, a couple of awesome little free books that you can get with your little electronic Bibles that will go walk you through what was life like in the first century. What do those people believe? How did they live? What kind of things did they do? Tremendously valuable information that will give you so much wisdom and insight into understanding Paul because that's the guy who's tripping everybody up. What about Josephus? Does that help?
Josephus will definitely help you, absolutely. I think that, um, yeah, I don't know how many of you have read Josephus. I think he's a great, he'll give you some great insight. That's one of the only ones that are available for, for getting insight into first century Judaism. And a lot of the stuff that you find in history books is based upon either him or Philo or Miletus. It's only like three or four guys that are, you know, writing at that time in Greek that are, their writings are still extant. So that's just a tremendous piece of uh, knowledge there that you really should pick up on to help you understand Paul a little better. Um, Gracie? To, to the book of Macca Maccabees, would that cover that stuff too? Uh, you know, the Maccabees was written about 146 years uh, before Yeshua came onto the scene. Um, so and yes, that will... They were getting started, yeah, absolutely. So the book of the Maccabees has not got a lot of evidence of that in it because it's mostly dealing with the land of the, the Holy Land at the time of Antiochus Epiphanes. But uh, I would say, you know, a lot of the, the, the Targums and the Mishnah and the Talmud, those things were written in the first century, a good, a good chunk of them. Perke Avot. Uh, is the wisdom of the fathers, you know, that was written at the time of Yeshua. In fact, there are several quotes that Jesus makes that are like verbatim from Perkei Avot. So he was familiar with, Jesus was very familiar with the rabbinic stuff at that time. Uh, but I would just encourage you to, if you want to get the most out of your Bible and look at what Paul is saying and try to understand Paul a little bit better, that's the missing puzzle piece right there. Mm -hmm. Anybody have any comments, questions, or concerns about that? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. And, uh, I you can tell me. All things are lawful to me. Yeah, I, just don't, I, I just don't have any issues understanding. Well, that I is. Think it is so clear that it's. I. I think well, it's Peter had clear. a problem. The Apostle Peter had a problem with Paul. Sure. He was showing favoritism. Yeah, he yeah. he was he was eating. Well, that you know that's a, that's a, that's a perfect example. Is like when Peter, you know, if if we opened our our fellowship up to a bunch of I don't know people who were like refugees from some other country or something, and they were totally Gentiles. I mean, you know, maybe they're they worship they're animists. You know, they worship trees or bushes or something, and some of them come into this fellowship. And we, you know, being of like mind, have fellowship together and we support and encourage one another. And then, you know, you go out and live among these people, but then when some of the members of this fellowship show up, you kind of walk away from those people and you're like, yeah, I'm not, I need to back away just a little bit. I don't want my people to see me hanging out with these other people. Then you, that is exactly what happened with Paul and Peter. And Peter said, you know, Paul said to Peter, you're, you're acting with hypocrisy. You're not demonstrating the love. So, you know, you can't eat with these Gentiles and think everything's okay until your Jewish brothers show up and say, okay, now I'm backing away from the Gentiles. You're, they're a hypocrite. You can't do that. So, yeah, they had some disagreements, but Peter definitely said that Paul was difficult to understand. And I think that if you're trying to, in the sense, only in the sense, that you're trying to rectify your Bible and make sense of how James and Peter and Paul and John and John and Jesus can be so different, you're going to have to rectify that. And I think that's a task that some people are really struggling with, is trying to understand why do James and Peter and Jesus all seem to be saying one thing, and P John seems to be saying something completely opposite. That's the big issue. Now, if you've worked that out for yourself, I'm going to have to talk to you. Because no I don't know if I have it. There wouldn't be contradictions in the Bible. I don't think there is. And, and, and I, don't, I, I absolutely don't think there is. I agree with you 100%. And I think that if you say we need to change Paul, no, I'm not saying that. No, no, I totally understand. If we say we have to take Paul out of the Bible, no, we don't. Because I, God created this universe. We have to take Paul out of the Bible. No, we don't. Because God created this universe. What is in that book from Genesis all the way to Revelation is God inspired God. And if he didn't yeah. want it in there, it would not be in there, I guarantee you. So there is a purpose for it being in there. And I think that that 
is something that absolutely we should study and yeah. figure out, you know, all of that as yeah. well. But, you know, and, and I would just say, I would encourage you, if you have trouble rectifying, then you should dig into it a little yes. bit more. That would be my whole yeah. point. Tracy, sorry. From our perspective of Hebrew roots and stuff, yes, we have a problem with what we consider to be people taking Paul out of context and basically aligning themselves with Paul rather than something else. Yes, I, I would just understand. Jerry. Every city that Paul went to was an imperial city, which, was, which simply means it was controlled by Rome and sure. Caesar was recognized as God. Yeah. And from my understanding, if you really look at Paul, he was not only a lawyer, he was a good lawyer. Yeah, and he sure. pitted Caesar against Christ. If you want to follow Caesar, if you're a slave, you can't own land, you can't own this beautiful land, you, you can't own any of this stuff. If you follow Christ, you can be the lowest man on the totem pole, and you can have eternal life. Sure. Make a choice. Yeah, yeah. When you really get into his writing, you'll see that all the way through him. Sure, sure. Love remember too that Paul yeah. is the apostle to the Gentiles. His message is of necessity going to be a little different. Mm -hmm than the other writers. Tracy. Oh, sorry, Gracie. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> you lost it? <laughs> That's what you get. But a lot of times in my communication or conversations with folks, it comes down to they're not understanding the different meanings, the different ways of using the word law. That's a big one. They just don't get it. And that's precisely what I'm talking about yes. here with first century Judaism because there are multiple definitions of what people are talking about. Yeah, absolutely. Mikey. Would, uh, over the last couple of weeks, I've had some divinely inspired email exchanges. <laughs> divinely inspired email. I like it. You study something out, you feel led to share something, you find some cool stuff in the scripture. You know, you make these connections. And 2,000 years from now, if someone took that email and said, oh, wow, look at this. Let me interpret this email and throw away the gospel. Would that make sense? No. no. So I kind of feel like sometimes when we create theology around letters and we say we can get rid of what God gave us in the Torah and take a letter from Peter, no, that would have been unthinkable to them. I'm yeah. absolutely confident. They have that. servants like us, divinely yeah. inspired whoever. We can't say who, who is and who isn't. Mm -hmm. sure. If we were to worship them, they'd say, don't do that. I'm like you. Sure. Mm -hmm. yeah. So we have to keep that in mind. We, we all are sharing what he has given us. They yeah. are sharing what he has given them. Mm -hmm. Sure. Absolutely. Jerry? A lot of Paul's letters are answers to a letter that somebody wrote to him. Sure, absolutely. So if you don't know, if you don't know what he's answering, what was really is very hard to say. Well, what, that's a good point. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's a good point that you want. Are you raising your hand? It's about <laughs> darn time. To say yes, please. <laughs> well, what helped me better understand Paul when I was going to Bible college was that Paul was more educated than the other apostles. That's a fair assumption, so, sure. Like when it came to circumcision or eating meat in the market, Paul saw from a strong spiritual sense, which they were trying to see, like, what are you talking about? Yeah. You know, circumcision? He's like, no, what I'm saying is if you don't get circumcised the heart, then physical circumcision means nothing. Yeah, absolutely. They couldn't yeah. understand that. That's why Paul was always in trouble. Sure. So to yeah. understand is now, I already, already do that, but also that Paul's not like the other ones at all. No, he's really not. He's very different. Nathan? Throw in your two cents. Well, or you're not really a Pauline supporter. I mean, if you were, the women would ask questions at home, not here. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody flick him in the head. <laughs> touche, Nathan. Touche, buddy. <laughs> That's a good answer, buddy. That's a good answer. Um, John, how you doing? Are you? Yeah. Okay, just checking on you. You haven't said anything. Just reading Paul's emails out of context. Yeah, I feel you. I feel you. Well, that was that was good. So I'm going to move forward into some questions.
There's Are we more. ready for this? Yeah. All right, this is good stuff. <laughs> oh, wait, there's more. Bonus. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we got time. We're doing okay. fine. Thank you. <laughs> this is a question from someone. Why do some Bible translations have Leviticus um, 5, 1 through 19 and 6, 1 through 30, while others have it numbered Leviticus 5, 1 through 26 and 6, 1 through 23? They are the same content but are numbered differently. It's a great question. Angela, what did you say? You know that. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. okay. Tell, you know the answer? Yes, that is correct. That is correct. And I will kind of run through this just briefly. This is a great question. And you know what? I, I, it's, it's, uh, it hadn't occurred to me that a lot of people just may not know that. Um, first of all, just a little bit of background. The chapters in the Bible, you know that when the Bible was written, both Greek and Hebrew, there were no chapters and verses. Okay. So the, the verses were added first in 1227 by a French guy in the name of uh, Stephen Langton, who was the bishop, uh, uh, the Archbishop of Canterbury. Uh, he was also a French guy at the University of Paris back in 1227. And then in about 1551, um, Robert Stephanus, who was another French guy who was a printer, put the verses in. Now. They are numbered differently. The Jews actually have a different numbering. You'll sometimes see in your Bible where there's like a different number that's next to your English number, and it says this is verse 1 for you, but this is verse 5 for the Jews. Because like, in, especially that happens in the book of the, of the Psalms, because there's like this little introduction for the choir master on the flute, you know. They include that as part of the verse, but in English they don't. And so by the time you get to verse 1, the Jews are already at verse 3 or verse 4. Um, but these, these references and reference numbers by doing chapters and verses were added for easier reference. They were not in the originals. But it is particularly helpful to be able to locate things, maybe quote passages, memorize scripture, stuff like that. So it's generally innocuous and any differences you see in text are going to be inconsequential. However, can you see anything that might be problematic with having verses and chapters? It's awfully easy to take things out of context. It is very easy to take things out of context. Yes, it is. You will often hear Bible phrases and stuff quoted out as like, Yes, uh, you know, and I would bring your attention to just a couple of things. For example, um, number one, did you know it's kind of interesting? Here's an interesting little thing that this was probably invented for Christians to be able to argue with Jews about Jesus, to quickly reference their Bibles to have arguments with Jews. It's very interesting. In fact, there was a movie based around this. I can't remember the name of the movie, but it was a, a Jesuit priest versus a rabbi that they would argue for fun in the court of the French king. Yeah, very interesting. Um, but yeah, generally innocuous, but you can see some problems. Like when, you're, like when you're transitioning, for example, between Matthew chapter 16 and 17, who was going to, Angie, who are you pointing at? Nathan. Nathan, what do you got, buddy? Throw it out there while I look this up. Yeah. Yeah, you know what book the he the Hebrew children start with? Leviticus. Because and if they continue in it, they, they memorize even more. But yeah. Standard Jewish education, so that might be why they might not need pinpoint. They could just say it is written. Yeah, and that's why. Who's going? What's interesting about children starting with Leviticus is that that's what the Acts 15 Council had them start with. Yes, it is. All those things they told them to do are from the book of Leviticus. That's right, and you know that's why. Oftentimes, Yeshua and the apostles will quote a brief section of the uh, prophets when they're trying to say, thus the prophecy was fulfilled when he said blah, blah, blah. They'll just quote a little sentence or something because that's how they jog their memory. They're like, oh yeah, I know what this is talking about. This is the prophet Isaiah who's saying such and such. 
That's their mnemonic device that they use to remember things is just quoting little tiny passages of it. But we are more attuned to in the book of Galatians chapter such and such, you know what I'm saying? So we get about we get a little bit better with that. But if you look at for example, this can be a problem when for example transitioning between Matthew chapter 16 and 17. If you're reading a chapter a day in your Bible, like we are often encouraged to do, and I do frankly myself, you can have a little a little trouble here when you skip and end for the day in Matthew 16 and then pick up Matthew 17 tomorrow, you might miss this little connection. Truly I say to you, there are some standing here today who shall not taste of death at all until they see the Son of Man coming in His kingdom. If you don't go immediately to the next chapter and say, and after six days Yeshua took Kepha and Yaakov and Yochanan, his brother, and brought them up on a high mountain by themselves and he was transformed. <laughs> You might think, you might form a whole theology or something. Uh, it's, you know, th that is precisely what happened at the book, in the end of the book of John, where, where he's taking Peter aside. And he's like, yeah, Peter's like, what about this dude? He's like, well, what if I want him to live until I return? So this, you know, rumor goes out that John's not going to die until Jesus returns. This is how these things get started. Angela? Yeah. And people, when I was in church, when, you know, why did God turn his back? And they got all hung up on, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? God forsaken me on the cross. When it actually was doing was from the first verse of the psalm, yes. which then, if you knew that psalm by heart, explained all the events that had just happened. Yes. I don't want you to go too deep into that because we have questions regarding that very psalm in our questions. <laughs> so you are correct, though. Absolutely. Thank you, Tracy. Another example. Yes, please. <laughs> so when, when it says in Matthew 13 that he spoke to the multitude in parables and without parables, he did not speak to them. Thus was the prophecy fulfilled. I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter dark secrets of old. Mm -hmm. If you go to where that's quoted, you'll go to Psalm, I want to say, 78. And then you'll learn what the parables are about. Give mm. ear to my Torah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Listen to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter dark sayings of old. Sure. So that you'll learn what these parables are all about. Yeah, yeah, excellent. Thank you. Um, I have another question here. This one is, uh, what are some of the Hebrew idioms used in the Berit Hadashah, the New Testament, that are misunderstood by Western society today? I'm sure you probably are aware of a few of these. Uh, does anybody have any just off the top of their head that they would throw out? Derek? Uh, I read them too quickly. Um, what is it? Um, it's in Corinthians. Um, it's like, uh, it's in Corinthians um, talking about um, the stony heart versus, uh, oh no, the writing in stone versus writing in flesh. Okay. Okay. Now, how would you compare? How would you differentiate those? Um, when a Christian reads that today, if there's you know there's a more traditional teaching that they get, they would interpret that um, the writing in stone is the law, all the Old Testament, and that's done away with, and now it's writing in a heart, which is this somehow it's a new, even though it's all the same words, it's somehow a new law of Christ. Okay. Which is somehow different than the law of God. Okay, so you're saying that that is a Hebrew idiom. How would you describe that idiom? Uh, yes, no, the Hebrew idiom would be actually talking about um, when you try to follow the law without faith and without the love, it becomes rote and it becomes just strict religion, and God hates that. Versus actually doing it with your heart, and you see the grace and you see the truth and all these different things that are added along. Which is what Messiah was teaching. Spiritual, was teaching spiritual the spirit of the law with the yeah. yeah. If you look at a woman lustfully, you have committed adultery, even if you haven't done it by the letter. Good. Cool. Okay. Um, any other any other Hebrew idioms? Yeah. I assume the um, the camel going through the eye of the needle is a Hebrew idiom. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I'm not, I'm not quite certain. I know there are many theories. I don't really know what you mean, but I assume that's one of them. Does anyone know what the camel going through the eye of a needle is? Wasn't there a door that the camel would kneel down and go under? Yeah, I heard that That's one. I don't know. That is one uh, little bit of legend or myth, or possibly I don't know. I have heard that before. I don't have a source for that, so I can't verify it. But that is what I have heard also. Um, Keith, or, no, I'm sorry, uh, Jerry. Another one is taking a rope and actually trying to put it through the eye of the needle. Yeah. Okay. Cool. 
How about, yes, Angela? When we were doing that letter last week, Coop. Yeah. I gave you a bunch of meetings for Coop, like back kid, monkey. Sure. One of the meetings in Aramaic, and I couldn't figure out what was I mean. Oh, yeah. So I don't know how, if you want to think about that. Okay. That yeah, I think that passage is also one of the proof texts people use to say the New Testament, at least the Gospels, were originally written in Hebrew, because if you, uh, if you bring back to either Aramaic or Hebrew, it makes sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 I've heard that too, yeah. Uh, I don't know if it's true, but I heard um, that the references to the day that no man knows or the twinkling of an eye are also oh, yeah. used. Yes, yes. So the day that no man knows, what do you what do you know? You some of you probably know enough about these Hebrew idioms that you've heard of that now. The day that no man knows. You know what that is? Yeah. What is it? Yeah. That is Yom Turah, the day of trumpets. That is correct. So there's a Hebrew idiom. Uh, but some have supposed it to mean that no one knows that day and no, you know, that's it's a total mystery. It doesn't exactly mean that. Um, you might look at, for example, an evil eye. Yeah. If your eye is if your eye is dark, you know, such like this, they have no idea exactly how to trans how to translate that. So they say, if your eye is dark, in the Greek, that literally says, if you have an evil eye. Yeah. Now that, that that doesn't make any sense. And some translations, even though they translate it, if your eye is dark, but what does that mean? I have glaucoma. I I've, I've got to get LASIK surgery or something. <laughs> What is the Hebrew idiom, uh, you're having an evil eye? What does that mean? Stingy. You're greedy. You're stingy. So if you just plug that in to that little parable that Yeshua is talking about, that'll make a whole lot more sense. Okay? Um, so I hope that that answers uh, this person's question regarding some Hebrew idioms. And there's a whole bunch of them. You can look online um, and do some of the historical research that I was talking about, you'll see all kinds of cool stuff like that regarding historical idioms. Um, I'm going to go to the next question. What can we understand about free will and predestination in regards to the book of Job, Judas and Jesus, uh, Jacob and Esau, Pharaoh having his hardened heart and such like that? This is a really challenging question. And frankly, I couldn't even possibly answer it, but I'm going to try. Um, this goes back to, did you know, I, I, when I was researching uh, on that, that subject of systematic theology, did you know that if you open up most Bible commentaries today, and this is true of most um, hardcore Bible commentaries from, and, and doctoral dissertations and stuff from most theological seminaries, that there is a consensus among Christian theologians and scholars from not only just secular universities like they got a master, I'm a master of divinity or a doctor of divinity at the University of Chicago. You've seen those guys on documentaries like for the History Channel and they show this is Professor Emeritus of the Doctor of Divinity program at Yale University and he goes on and you just know he's not a Christian mm -hmm. the way he talks about it yeah. and then but I, th I assumed, okay, that goes so far as people in the university who are teaching religious classes at a secular university. That is not so. That is not so. The people, guys like that, are, are, are actually involved in what is called the uh, criticism, the biblical criticism. And these are people who are incredibly secular. And they are the ones who are working in all of these theological seminaries to instruct the laity in the foundational doctrines of their specific denomination. And you know what you will find when you look at these commentaries from Christian scholars? There are no miracles in the Bible. There are not. And this is the reaction to people during the Enlightenment and how we have to dumb down our Christianity in order to get along with science. You know that the Red Sea was not parted, right? It was mud flats that were, you know, the, the, the wind came and blew an opening so that they didn't get their feet wet walking through the, re the Sea of Reeds. It's not the Red Sea. It's a mistranslation. It's the Sea of Reeds, which is only about yay deep, okay? Um, there is no historic predictive prophecy. These guys do not believe that the, that the book of Daniel was even written by a real guy named Daniel during the time of Nebuchadnezzar. It was written at the time of Judas Maccabee. Okay? This is what has really kind of freaked me out, is that people believe this stuff in seminaries that are teaching our pastors. 
They don't believe in, in, in miracles. Any miracle that can possibly be explained we're using a natural phenomenon, is they, that's what they do. If they can't describe it, they say that's fanciful. Like Predictive, the like the virgin birth. Keith. So the puddle spread and then came crushing in on Pharaoh's <laughs> army and killed them all. They got stuck in the mud. I, I don't know. I have no idea. But that, uh, that was what was so weird to me. So that's part of the problem with the secular world encroaching upon Christianity. And Christianity now, a lot of these seminaries do not believe in miracles. They do not believe in predictive prophecy. They do not believe in, 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 in they believe in inspiration. But if it can't be explained logically and reasonably, they explain it away. And it goes bye-bye. That is a terrible, terrible tragedy. And this, the ideas of like free will and predestination, they can't get their heads around that. How can it be that God would allow Satan to attack Job? That doesn't make any sense. How can it be that did Jesus know what Judas was going to do? When Satan entered into Judas in the book of John, did Judas not have any choice about what he was going to do? Did Jake, how, did, how does it say in the book of Romans that Jacob I loved and Esau I hated before neither was born and had done anything wrong? Was Pharaoh's heart hardened? You know, we, and rabbinic Judaism has the same problem. You want to read a rabbinic commentary about Pharaoh? They have all kinds of things that they'll wrap around themselves around the axle trying to explain how that doesn't mean what you think it means. It doesn't mean literally that God controlled this man and used him like a puppet, like a tool. Now, I have read this sometimes, and I, and I kind of think about that. I think, okay, well, some rabbis, I think, that are a little bit more honest will say, well, there is some, t some change in the Hebrew language that sometimes it seems like God is taking full control of Pharaoh and he becomes like a puppet. There are other times when Pharaoh is like, he wants to keep fighting against God because that's what's in his heart. But he's run out of he's run out of poop. I can't do it anymore. He wants to collapse and give up. But God's like, let me strengthen you, wipe your brow, give you a drink of water, get back into the fight. I know you want to fight. You just don't have the strength to do it. Let me help you. There's in a sense both of those things can be true. That's the problem when we're trying to rationalize our faith. You can't rationalize this stuff. How can you rationalize that you are saved by grace through faith? and yet you want to keep the Torah. Those two things seem to be completely at odds. But I would say to you, there are so many ways that you could demonstrate that it's true from your Bible. And people do. We saw a debate the other day, you know, with Daniel Joseph and this other guy where they both had excellent points. I can show you a hundred scriptures that talk about how you're saved by grace through faith. I can show you a hundred scriptures to where you need to do something with that that you, these guys are fighting about this for a long, long time. We have to hold these things in tension. We have to understand that free, there is free will. Yes, you are held responsible. Paul deals with this. He says, how can we be held responsible for what we do because who can resist his will? You know what Paul's answer to this question is? Shut up. <laughs> That's what he said. Who are you to even ask that question? The thing that is made will not say to the person who made it, why did you make me like this? You apparently don't even have the right to ask that question. Yes. That is exactly what he said to Job. So I think that this is a really challenging situation that we have to hold in tension and say, I know that each is true. I know that I'm saved by grace through faith. I know that I have to observe His commandments. I know that, uh, that I have a free will, and yet He certainly seems to have a driving force in my life. You have to be able to hold those things in tension. You can't explain everything away. Faith isn't like that. Mm -hmm. I was going to say the same thing Trace said, but... Um, in better wording? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. While we have this free will and there is a plan, there's also things that we 
we don't see. Sure. Our battle's not in a selection zone. Yeah. Right? In Daniel, we see that uh, the angel is fighting with the Prince of Persia. Yeah, yeah. These yeah. Are spiritual battles, things that are taking place. Obviously, this, this battle between Job and, and um, or between God and, and Satan using Job, that's yeah. a spiritual battle. There's sure. a point being made, and it mm -hmm. was eventually to glorify the Creator. Absolutely. And Tracy and um, Andrew pointed out, it's very similar to like when they asked the Messiah, who sinned? You know, this man or his father? It, this man or his father, yeah. in the case of the blind man, but it was... Neither is for the glory of God to be revealed. That's yeah. very much the same thing that we see yes. in Job. Absolutely. And I think that's a good example of a heap, a, a, one of those cultural things that you wouldn't be aware of, is because it is strongly taught in Judaism that there is no issues in life without transgression. Everything bad that happens is a result of sin, no matter what. But then along comes Yeshua and his disciples, and they're like, who sinned, this guy or his parents? He was born blind. And Yeshua said, and it was neither. So that's, a, that's again, a, an example of, of you know, holding these things in tension. We just need to do it. It's tough. Did you want to say something, Tim? Yeah, I just want to say, there's, I mean, just because God knows everything that's going to happen, you still have free will. You still make those choices. He might know what you're going to choose. Okay, so hold on, hold on to that so thought. Now, what if? To it. Okay, so some people who that would, and I'm not saying you're an Arminianist or anything, but that's what Arminius said, and the other side of John Calvin saying God knows what's going to happen in the future. That's what it means. Predestined is like God knows. God has foreknowledge. Yes, from the Book of Romans. Now, the problem with that is if God just knows in advance what people are going to do and he's reacting to that, then who's in charge? People. That means that the world is run by humans and God is just reacting to them. Now, that's what a Calvinist would say to an Arminius. Sure. The man that got in the car and decided it was his free will to Absolutely. get in the car and drive drunk and right. hit us head on and kill someone, right? Sure. So that was his free will. Yeah. I didn't have free will in that situation no. because I was just driving along and yeah. enjoying my Sunday evening. That's and right. And he hits us. Now, where God takes that is he says, I know this is going to happen to you, but mm -hmm. I'm going to take that situation that you are in, and I'm going to turn it around, what the enemy meant for evil. Sure. And that man's free will caused pain in my life sure. and in my family's life, <clears throat> and he can take that and he can say, well, I'm going to redirect it this. So See, I think that's the power. That's the power of our God is to take free will and it just works out exactly as His will is. That is what is God's will being done no matter what. Is you can do whatever you want. You have free will. But it's going to work out in His way no matter what you do. You can't get away from it. You've heard about the guy who's running from death, you know, and it catches him in the place that he least expects it. You can't run away from the will of God. You're not going to get away from it. But uh, this is a good point. Uh, Mike, sorry. I, I think that is a great point. I think we see that, you know, that God uses all things. It's all throughout the Torah that even when sin is there, that it is directed mm -hmm. towards his plan. Mm -hmm. The piece that gets a little fuzzy is that you have all of these messianic pictures all throughout the Torah that are filled like, even the comparison between Judah and Judas, Judas, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. All these things. So, yeah, Judas has free will to <laughs> make these choices, but he made these choices the same way that Judah did, mm -hmm. right? Like it, they put these stories played out the same. Yeah. How yeah. much of this is interwoven in a predetermined plan yeah. versus these men's free? Will? Yeah, that is a really, really challenging thing to to address, man. I don't even I don't know how to answer that question. It's really, really challenging. You got to have faith in God that everything that happens is for a reason. I think that's what Paul is trying to tell us in Romans chapter eight. Everything works together for good. He's not going to try to tell you who's causing what, whether it's your fault or Satan's fault or God had willed it to happen. 
you just say, give glory to God. I know that all things work together for good. That's about as good as we're going to get an answer to that thing as far as I'm concerned. Tracy and then Gracie. I think uh, like what Tam is saying, and Mike and I have talked about this too, that we've experienced traumatic things in our lives. And mm -hmm. if we do come to the forefront of our faith, and it's not just about the Mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. glorify him or to deny him. Mm -hmm. And I think the greatest thing is to glorify God in, in your struggle, in your suffering. Sure. Yeah. That is where and your struggle testament. becomes the most redemptive, is when people see you struggling like that mm -hmm. and you actually overcome that and be an example in the midst of that pain and suffering is the most redemptive. Grace and then Jerry. In, in the Old Testament, bothered me since I was a kid was how that in the history of the kings and the, and the children of Israel and all their enemies, other countries and stuff the Israelites would sin, God would have the other countries come in and conquer them mm -hmm. and then they would be punished for conquering them when it's what God had told made happen Sure. Does it frustrate you anymore? I don't know when it was. It took me a while. I woke up. Well, that's because he's gone. That's a great answer. Great answer. Jerry. Look at it. The greatest example of free will to me in the Bible is Yeshua himself. I yeah. mean, God made a prediction to Eve that the Messiah would come and save the people. Yeah. But God couldn't have made that prediction. If he didn't know that 6,000 years later, Yeshua was going to hang on the cross. And yeah, absolutely. The world. He didn't make, I mean, Yeshua, he went to the garden of the Sunday, he didn't, he didn't want to go to that cross. Yeah, he absolutely. He begged his father not to go to that cross. He, I mean, he swept great drops of, bullet, drops of water. Blood, you know? yeah. He absolutely. He was not looking forward to that at all. But yeah. God knew and he knew. They must have had a little conversation before. Well, they were, <laughs> when they were, you know, when they were one. Yeah. He knew that he would, he, he told his father, I'm going to do that. Sure, sure. And there was all kinds of prophecies in the Old Testament. He said, I'm going to die, be in the ground three days and three nights. Yep. He couldn't say that if he didn't know he was going to do it, even though he didn't want to do it. Yeah, absolutely. And Angela, I have you know, a feeling. That was feeling. but God knew that it was going to happen. So he could, he could predestine something because of his foreknowledge that it was yeah. going to happen. That's what I see. That's a fair, reasonable assumption. Angela, what do you got? You mean your Hebrew lesson anyway. Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. Here's a word in Hebrew. Okay. We've been talking about this thing about having to hold two things that are opposite intention at the same time. And that's just the way it is. Just accept it. Um, okay. Here's this word in Hebrew. Now, we haven't looked at this letter yet. It's a shin, but it means fire. We've talked about this before. If you were here when we were talking about Matthew. Okay, we've got the shin, which is the letter that means fire. It ends, because Hebrew reads this way, it ends with the mem, which means water. Now, fire and water, do they mix? No. No. One undoes the other. Either the, the water puts out the fire, or the fire evaporates the water in the steam. They don't get along, do they? No. But how many times in the, when it describes where God is, does it include both fire and water? Name of it is fire water, yeah. the seventh plague, when he will send all his plagues, fire and ice. So God is, the, you know, the, the idea of him is two things that don't necessarily go together. And this word, these two letters here, we've covered. This one, one of the meanings of it can be to bind, and one of the meanings of this letter can be just secure. And so here we have fire bound and secured to water in this Hebrew word. And what is this Hebrew word? Shalom. Which means peace. peace. Great illustration. Somehow he does it. He takes two things that don't belong, and it, means, it also means completeness. And can we say flesh and spirit, you, two things that don't belong. Yeah. Two things that don't belong together, but he is working on making us be at peace with them. Which one should be subject to the other? Bless you. The flesh is subject to the spirit. Esau will serve Jacob. Jacob. 
Excellent. Thank you. Derek. I wanted to add on kind of like a summarization of what people were saying. was like, um, it makes me think about um, when Jesus said, uh, blessed are those who are not offended of me. Yeah. And it's like, that is a very powerful thing to try and grasp because so many things can be answered sometimes. Sure. And there's a lot of places where it's arguable that feels very offensive. Sure. <laughs> Absolutely. And so that's, 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 that's his answer. Just that's your answer. You, you yeah. And as Tracy said, to choose the term to God versus being yeah. angry and turn away. Absolutely. Uh, please. Yeah. Uh, I thought you were sleeping over there. The fire and the water. Yeah. Uh, it's interesting because those are both two methods of purification. Yes. The fire and the water. Which one would you rather be purified by? <laughs> 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 the fire will not burn you. So right now your choice is water. Later, the only option is fire. Yeah. Yes. Let us let us choose to purify by water, lest we be purified by fire. True that. True that. Um, it is a, rapidly approaching that time where we're going to stop and have some um, some food and fellowship. But what I'm and, and I uh, I do have another two pages of questions. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to change my page here to put up the next series of questions. Feel free to discuss them amongst yourselves if you'd like. I will also try to respond through email or maybe just hold these, you know, and the next page as something to just kind of throw out for maybe a brief discussion, you know. I think Angela's almost done with the uh, with her Hebrew lessons for a little while. And maybe, you know, we take one of these questions and we bat it around for a few minutes before we start our study or something, you know. So I'm going to leave them up there if you want to, you know, chit-chat about them. But I also would like to incorporate them because there's a couple of great questions and I have pages and pages of notes regarding these questions. So I'm sorry I didn't get to them. Yeah, that, they're good questions and I would like to deal with them a little more specifically. But I'm going to leave this one up in case you want to, uh, you know, chat about them. These are great questions. Um, anything else? I'm going to wrap up and pray and we're going to hit the food and the wine and the fellowship. Sound good? Awesome. Let's pray.